All right, welcome to the online causal inference seminar. Today we have uh, Eric Chetkin Chetkin from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania talk about selective machine learning of doubly robust functionals. Uh, after that, we have a discussion by Stein uh, Van Stilland. Uh, and then if we have some time left, we will open the floor and take some questions from the audience. Uh, Eric will also stop from time to time to, to take questions from you. So please submit your questions uh, via Q&A. All right, uh, switching now over to Guillaume. So, because he, he will uh, handle questions. Thank you, Dominique. So as Dominique said, questions uh, should be submitted, question about the, the talk should be submitted through the Q&A. Um, today, uh, Yifan uh, couldn't make it to the, to the, to the talk. So uh, there won't be any, anybody handling uh, questions except um, uh, Eric. So um, Eric will pose at two points during the talk. So if you have questions, submit them through the Q&A. I will select some of them and uh, we will uh, uh, ask them uh, live. Um, I will reach out to you if your question is selected to ask you to raise your hand uh, and uh, if you're willing to ask your question in, in person. Um, so please don't raise your hand until I've asked you to do so. Um, that's pretty much it from me, uh, Eric. Uh, feel free to start whenever. All right. Um, thank you, Guillaume. Thank you to the organizers for uh, allowing me to present some of our work here. I particularly want to thank Michael, Guillaume, and uh, Dominique and Ido uh, for the invitation and for uh, facilitating this, this talk. This is joint work with my current postdoc, Yifan uh, Kree. This is actually mostly his work. Um, I helped help along with editing. Um, selective machine learning of WA bus functionals is the title. Um, so when I get started, um, so the, the, the general premise for this work is um, basically that modern semi-thematic methods have recently incorporated the use of machine learning um, for functional estimation. Consider the now very familiar goal of estimating um, the average potential outcome uh, for treatment being set to level little a. Um, I'm writing it as a, we're writing it as a functional um, that over theta indexes, the leveling law may be a very high dimensional parameter for the underlying observed beta distribution under standard assumptions that kind of actual mean is obtained by this functional, um, also known as the G formula. And then the mapping from theta to side theta essentially is a mapping from the distribution of y given x and a and the density of x to the real y in this case. Estimating psi in most such settings typically involves first stage estimation of a high dimensional nuisance parameter. If we were to take the model to be unrestricted and a non-parametric model, for instance, one might consider um, estimating the the regression curve, the mean of y given x and a, and then plugging it in with the empirical distribution of f, that would be one step. There's also a version of, um, of a substitution estimator using inverse probability representation of this functional. And of course, there's a third one, which is the W robust that uses both parameterization, both parameters, the outcome regression and the propensity score. An important goal in semi-parametric estimation is to minimize the bias of psi hat, encourage you to bias in theta hat, the first step, the first stage estimation of the nuisance parameter. Um, there's been a lot of work in this in this field, and I think uh, what's considered by most to be the state of the art is the double the bias machine learning framework of Cheno, Zukav, and colleagues which has two essential ingredients and basically unifies a lot of methods that have been available and creates a gen generic framework for conducting inferences in such problems. So the first step in uh, the approach requires finding a moment equation, an estimate equation, which we call U, um, which will depend on psi, it's a moment equation for psi, and will also depend on a set of nuisance parameters theta. 
And um, the approach requires finding such a moment equation for um, psi, which is locally robust in the sense that not only does it have mean zero when you plug in it through psi and theta, but upon perturbing the estimate equation uh, along a path of the nuisance parameter. Um, so that's what this means. You look at your estimate equation mu, uh, your estimate function mu at the true psi, and you perturb along the direction of one of the nuisance parameter. Well, that derivative has mean zero. And so you get this local robustness property. Um, they coined the term mu and orthogonality for any moment equation that satisfies this equation. Um, and then there's a second step will be you use, once you've identified such a moment equation, you use it as an estimating equation using cross-fitting to construct psi hat by first estimating theta hat in a split sample and finding the solution to this moment equation in, a, in the second half of the sample. Psi hat then is shown under mild regularity conditions to attain root end rate for psi. Um, and the main requirement is that your nuisance parameter is estimated at the fast enough rate um, on um, the L2, in the L2 norm, um, and it should be faster than N to a quarter. So, um, so given this this proposal, um, and and the fact that the the main the core idea behind the proposal is that this approach actually allows you to use fairly generic machine learning tools to estimate data, and you don't necessarily need to really understand the complexity. Of, of that, that machine learner, uh, provided you're fortunate enough that it converges fast enough. So I'm gonna, um, let's suppose this, this holds um, for a number of learners. Um, as we know, machine learning uh, is particularly popular because for a given data set, um, a particular machine learner can adapt um, to the structure in the data and, and the smoothness of uh, embedded in the data. And, and there are many such learners, um, given the growing number of machine learners. Um, one open question is, well, how do I decide which learner to use in um, the, this, this first step uh, estimation of the nuisance parameter, if my goal is to minimize the bias of the estimated functional, such as the average causal effect. Okay, so, so consider the, the spell generic setting where you might have a collection of k learners, and I'm gonna call them theta one hat and theta k, that are constructed from in this split sample um, design. And, uh, and now we want to find the first digit estimator theta hat k hat to ensure that the selected k hat denotes that I've selected one of these theta hat according to some criteria. Um, this collection might include random forest, lasso, great geometry trees, or any other uh, super learner, or any, any, any uh, machine learning algorithm um, you, you you favor, um, and but the, the question now is how do I select the best learner or ensemble of learners to ensure a small bias of, of my ultimate target of inference, psi hat in finite samples. So that's the first challenge. We're gonna put forth a, a, a proposal to address this challenge. Then the second question is, upon selecting such a nuisance parameter adaptively, how to perform um, valid inferences that account for this first stage selection of the machine learning. So we're gonna propose a general framework to address A and B for a very large class of functionals which admit a W robust property. So the theory is based, is grounded in semi-parametric theory. And the reason is because semi-parametric theory automatically gives you, um, uh, allow, provides a tool to derive estimate equations that do satisfy the uh, Neyman orthogonality condition. Um, that's the first, the first uh, required step in the double machine learning framework. So an influence function is a fundamental object of semi-parametric theory that allows us to characterize a wide range of estimators and their efficiency. The influence function of a regular and asymptotically linear estimator, psi hat of psi theta, is a random variable, which I'll call if, and which will depend on theta, it will typically depend on psi as well, based on IV samples, OI, which captures the first order asymptotic behavior of your estimator such that 
you get the standard expansion of your estimator that allows you to de describe its asymptotic theory as, um, and asymptotic behavior as a normal distribution with variance, therefore determined by IF. Now, <clears throat> the set of all influence functions um, of RAL estimators of a given functional side theta is contained in this, the Hilbert subspace of mean zero random variables that solves the following integral equation. If I were to take the derivative of my function on a longer parametric stock model indexed by t, um, there is a, a, any variable u that solves this equation where s is a score along that path and is known to be an influence function in the sense that if I were to solve the estimate equation based on u, I would have under certain condition the following expansion um, that provides asymptotic linearity of my estimator, the solution of such an influence function. The important reasons um, for considering such influence functions uh, or such estimate equations is because of the following property. I'm going to restrict myself to a class of influence functions that are known that, that is known to be W robust. It's going to depend on two new test parameters. Um, theta one indexes the law of the covariate fx, and theta two, uh, the parameter theta two contains components. Um, there are going to be two components, one b and one p. And if you're thinking ahead a little bit, you might think of b as being an outcome regression in the causal effect setting of where we're targeting the kind of actual mean, and p might uh, might be the propensity score or one over the propensity score in this case such that the influence function of uh, the functional side theta of interest has in, uh, the following form. Um, the influence function is linear in psi, and it depends on a random variable h, which takes the following form, which is linear in both b and p. So you get a product of b and p, a main effect of b, a, a main term of b, and a main term of, of p, and an intercept function, which depends on, on o. Okay, um, so there, are, the reason we will focus on this, this class of influence function um, is because um, these influence functions are known to satisfy the following double robustness property, that if I were to evaluate the mean of H for any function of any choice of B, let's call it B star at a true P, or for any choice of P at a true B, that's exactly the same as evaluating that function H, that random variable H, where B and P are evaluated at the true, and that will coincide with the parameter of interest. And this is known as the double robustness property of functionals of this form, uh, with influence function of this form. There are many examples that fall in this class of, that admit influence functions that are W robust. Um, the expected product of conditional expectation, estimating full data functional when data are missing at random, semi-parametric regression, estimating full data functional when data are missing not at random, in the context of sensory analysis of Robbins and colleagues. Uh, instrumental variable estimation, double negative control of a measure confounding, and average treatment effect on a no measure confounding. Um, we'll use this, um, the average treatment effect on the no measure confounding as our running example. So the, the notation here is as follow. The observed data consists of an exposure of treatment A, an outcome Y, and a, and a set of confounders X. Um, a will be taken to be a binary treatment, um, Y invariate, and uh, um, we wish to make inference about the average treatment effect, um, which I don't think I need to describe to this group. Um, three important assumptions sufficient for identification of this effect, which we'll sort of make consistency, ignorability, and positivity. Uh, as far as we're concerned is we're focusing on the statistical problem of how best to estimate the identifying uh, functional of, of the average cost of effect, which is given in this expression, is the marginal mean of uh, the conditional mean difference um, of the, uh, the outcome for the treated versus the untreated, and then the average is taken with respect to the marginal law of x. The first order influence function of this functional takes this form, I have theta, which is given here, which um, is can be shown to be in the W robust class that I described in the prior slides. Um, this is a well-known W robust estimate equation of the average causal effect. Um, 
it um it's by virtue of being influenced so i'm showing you it immediately known to uh, satisfy the Neiman orthogonality condition for Trigos, Brock, Kuzov, and, and colleagues. I'm going to stop here to see if there are any questions. Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, there's a quick uh, clarifying question here. Um, so about the about the, the general setting. So um, the 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 main goal is to um, uh, to do post selection inference uh, after selecting the the learner at the first stage or to account for the fact that you selected the runner at the first stage. Um, would the same uh, kind of problem arise if, if you do some kind of um, uh, model averaging of all of those learners um, to, to kind of build a uh, one that uh, aggregates them? Yeah, so that's that's a really great question. So I, I so the, the first goal, in fact, is first to um, decide how best to select um, the first stage learner. Um, keeping in mind that we have in view um, to minimize the, uh, as our main goal, to minimize the bias of this functional. And so are we first going to focus on this first stage is how best to actually select the learners. And I'm going to start, uh, most of the talk is going to be um, focused on this idea that we have a collection of learners. Some of them themselves can be um, stacked, est stacked estimators or, or, or um, some kind of model averaging. Um, and I'll come back to that later on. But for the time being, we'll just assume that we have a collection of such learners and we want to um, select the best learner in order to minimize the bias of this functional. The second goal will be, then be to describe a simple method to try to account for that selection step. But most of the focus is actually going to be on the selection step. Got it. Thanks, Eric. Oh, and uh, also um, we got a, a, some 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 comments that some people can't hear you very well. Can you try to uh, either put the mic closer or? Oh, absolutely. Sorry about that. I will speak louder and bring the mic closer. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. Okay. I'm all good. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Thank you, you. All right. So we're going to build um, this this model selection framework. So for each learner pair. K1, K1 tilde, um, K1 referring to a particular learner you have for the propensity score, and K1 tilde referring to a particular learner you have for the outcome regression. You might consider, I'm gonna use ra uh, random forest to estimate the outcome regression, and I might use gradient boosting trees to estimate the propensity score, okay? So for each type learner, K1, K1 tilde, um, we have a corresponding parameter evaluated at, psi one, at K1 and K1 tilde, and we're going to define the following perturbation of a fixed index pair. So considering the pair K1, K1 tilde, I'm going to perturb <clears throat> um, the nuisance parameters, and I'm going to compare the functional psi at K, K tilde to the functional at K1 and K1 tilde. Okay, and I'm going to index those perturbations by um, the, the, the four indices, uh, the first two corresponding to psi K, K tilde, and the second um, pair corresponding to what we're comparing it to. In this case, our index comparison is to uh, uh, an estimator that uses learners K1 and K1 tilde. Then we'll consider unidirectional perturbations. So consider a perturbation. Still, we're anchored at K1, K1 tilde, and we want to learn how stable is this choice of learners, K1, K1 tilde. Well, there are two ways to examine how stable it is. I could take a perturbation where I hold the propensity score at K1 and I perturb the outcome regression from K1 tilde to another learner, K tilde. So I might go from um, K1 tilde was I was using random forest. I might compare it to using the lasso for the outcome regression. And that perturbation turns out to have a very simple form. It's, uh, it's the uh, the average um, sum of two perturbations, the perturbation in the outcome regression, and the perturbation of propensity score from your choice K1 to the true propensity score. Okay? And the idea is that this is telling us something about how stable is our learner for the propensity score. By the double robustness property, we know that if K1, uh, if the, the machine learner K1 is really good, then this perturbation should be insensitive or should be very inv somewhat invariant to my choice of learner for the outcome regression. I can likewise consider a perturbation in the propensity score learner direction 
in which case the first index varies from K1 to K, and the second index is kept maintained at K1 tilde. So there are two kinds of perturbation I could consider anchored at a learner K1, K1 tilde. And the idea is if I had chosen the best possible learner for K1, K1 tilde, I know by the double robustness property that these both of these perturbations should be small because the best learner is doubly robust. And therefore this um, this quantity should be small and this quantity should be small such that these perturbations should in turn be small. And so we're going to use this idea, in fact, to decide which pair of learners, K1, K1 tilde, is best or is closest to satisfy this double robustness, local robustness property. And we'll use that as a, as a criteria for selection. So we have two kinds of criteria. One is the mini-max criteria, um, where we take these maximal perturbations, which are perturbations where I hold either the propensity score at K1, K1, at K1, and I perturb the outcome regression, and I find the maximum perturbation along the outcome regression. And I do the same thing where I hold the uh, outcome regression at K1 tilde and I perturb the propensity score and I find the maximal perturbation. And I take the maximum of those two maximal perturbation and we'll call that a pseudo risk. It's not an actual risk. It depends on all of the uh, learners, um, but it will, it will have the behavior, uh, an appealing behavior in the sense that um, it, will, it aims to minimize the bias and, and to find the choice of K1, K1 tilde that will meet, ultimately minimize this risk. Okay? So this measures the maximum change of underlying functional induced by perturbing one of the users parameter at a time and holding the other fixed. Evaluating the above perturbation for each pair K1, K1 tilde gives us um, K1 times K2 pseudo risk, where K1 is the number of learners we have for the propensity score, and K2 is the learn number of learners we have for the outcome regression. So we do this for all possible combinations. We obtain a, a risk for all possible combinations of K1, K1 tilde. And then we define our selected model, our selected learner, as the one that minimizes these, pertur minimizes these perturbations. Okay? And so we'll call this selector the minimax cred selector. It's a min along the possible learners of the maximum perturbation, thus the name minimax. K star, K star tilde is a pair of learners that is the most robust to unidirectional perturbations. We also define a, uh, another kind of, uh, of pseudo risk. This pseudo risk considers, again, we're anchoring ourselves at K1, K1 tilde, and it consists of two pieces. Again, two maximum perturbations. The first one, we hold the propensity score at K1 learner, and we perturb the outcome regression, but we look at all pairwise perturbation of the outcome regression among our learners. So all K tilde, K tilde is zero among all our learners for the outcome regression. And we do the same thing, holding the outcome regression at K1 tilde, where we're evaluating our risk, and we look at all pairwise perturbation of the propensity score, and we sum the two. Evaluating the above perturbation for each pair K1, K1 tilde gives us K1 times K2 pseudo risk values. And we define the uh, selector here as KO, KO tilde, which minimizes this, um, this risk. And the reason we're considering these two types of pseudo risk, it turns out they have very different behaviors. I will see, as we'll see later, the mixed minimized criteria has uh, double or process property, um, and I should have mentioned this is what we call the mixed minimax criteria, is the second um, pseudo risk criteria. While the minimax, cri minimax criteria, the one that I presented in the prior slides, does not have a double robustness property. Um, how do we use, so note that these were first defined at the population level in the sense that the perturbations were assuming you actually had access to, in the validation sample, the underlying population alone. How do we do this? And to, uh, in order to avoid overfitting, we'll use a multi-fold cross-validation scheme, which repeatedly splits the data into two sub-samples. So let's consider one, one split. You will have a training sample from which we'll obtain the uh, learners, we evaluate the learners for pi, the propensity score, and the learners for the outcome regression. And the validation of both from which we select uh, estimate side for each selected, for each possible um, nuisance uh, learner, and evaluate the corresponding side for the selected learner using our criteria. 
we average, in order to select this, this learner, we average the estimated perturbations across S splits to obtain a perturbation, an empirical perturbation, which we'll denote as per hat. And then we, we use the empirical selector as a um, uh, realized version of our selection process. So um, just to sum up what the generic model selection algorithm is, what uh, the empirical one, so you have a data set and you have K1 times K2 community models, K1 for the propensity score, K2 for the outcome regression. You, so the selected model is going to be, are going to be for the first criteria, K1 dagger and K tilde dagger. And this is the output of our algorithm and K diamond and K tilde diamond. This is the first pair is the output from the minimax criteria. The second pair is from the mixed minimax criteria. So for each split, we're gonna do this S times. For each split, we'll construct um, all of the learners in the training sample and the validation sample will, for each KK tilde, we'll solve for the corresponding um, estimated functional. And for each pair K1, K1 tilde, we average the perturbations over the splits. We get the, uh, an average of perturbations across the cross-validated split. And likewise, for each pair K1, K1 tilde, we also, we obtain um, the minimax and the mixed minimax criteria in this cross validation scheme, and we pick the uh, pair of the pair of learners that minimize uh, each one of these criteria, and we can obtain our an estimated parameter averaging across the splits in the validation sample <clears throat> at our selected um, pair of learners. Um, the first K dagger, K dagger tilde is an empirical selector using the minimax criteria. The second one is an empirical selected um, parameter using the mixed minimax criteria. So what are um, some of the properties of, of, of these uh, selection screen, schemes? So let me go quickly through some theory. Um, so consider you had a collection of learners. So we'll first study our all across selector where in the validation sample, you actually have access to the underlying law that you need the data. And you want to, you're playing this theoretical game where you're trying to decide which learner trained from a training sample. And let's imagine we're only doing this in one split. And suppose that we, uh, using our, our generic notation for this class of W robust estimators, or so FP and D, you can think of P as the propensity score and D as the outcome regression. And we've obtained from an independent sample of size N, we've obtained K1 learners of a propensity score we call CP and K2 learners of the outcome regression we call C, B, and E. Now, suppose that the, this assumption essentially says that sufficiently, sufficiently large N uh, sample sizes, the propensity score admits a convergence rate for each learner of nu J. So nu J will be the convergence rate of the propensity score. And the outcome regression admits a convergence rate of W of omega J. So without loss of genealogy, suppose that the mean of the convergence rate of the learners from the propensity score, so this is the best possible learner you can obtain for the propensity score, that that convergence rate is actually faster than the best possible rate of convergence you can obtain for the outcome regression. And, and this is without loss of genealogy, you can do the opposite and we'll get to a similar result as well. Let um, nu max and omega max be the worst convergence rates. And this could be also a learner that fails to converge. So this could be order one. Yeah, it would be okay for a result. On the malcondition, the bias of the minimax oracle selector is of the following order. So we can ignore nu max and omega max. The important point is to note that the best rate you would obtain using the minimax oracle selector is actually a maximum rate. So it's the best rate you would obtain um, from the outcome regression, which is of course worse than the best rate you can obtain for the propensity score in the, under these assumptions. And so essentially you get a second order bias when using this, this the minimax oracle selector, but it's a maximum rate, okay? While the bias of the mixed minimax oracle selector is of the order, you get the product of the two best rates, the best rate you would get in uh, selecting the 
um, progressive score, and the best rate you will get in selecting the outcome regression, you get the product of these. And this mixed uh, bias structure is essentially equivalent to the property of double robustness. Well, this is not. This is essentially equivalent to um, you get if uh, the, the, the best possible rate you can obtain for the worst of the two, um, the outcome regression of the progressive score. In this case, it's the outcome regression. Okay. And so the bottom line here is that the mixed but minimax oracle selector may actually be in most settings prefer, pre, uh, according to this criteria, asymptotic criteria, would recover the minimax rate of estimation in this particular context. Um, if we're using this to select um, machine learners, <clears throat> while the, mix, the minimax oracle selector may not have that property, but we'll still continue to explore its properties in finite sample to see whether it, it does yield some kind of bias reduction. So I'm going to stop. Uh, oh, I do have another theorem before I can stop for some questions. Um, so this first result was about the properties of the Oracle selector. The second result is about excess risk bound of an actual empirical selector. So the left hand side of this inequality, so it's a standard error bound that um, similar to the ones that um, Ed Kennedy presented at the, the last talk uh, in a different context here. So the left hand side is the actual risk or pseudo risk of our selector. And this basically says that it's not too far off from the um, risk of the Oracle selector, the one who would have access to actual underlying data genetic mechanism in the validation sample. And the error bound, the, 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 um, the error rate between these two is of the order of one over n. So it's a pretty fast rate, uh, it's essentially parametric rate uh, <coughs> in estimating these risks. Um, so this, the, the same result holds for, this is given for the minimax selection, but the same result holds for the mixed minimax criteria. So this essentially says that you don't incur too much by using this cross-validation, too much of a price by using this cross-validation um, selector compared to if you actually had the underlying, access to the underlying law that generated the data, which of course we don't, but it's a good reference uh, for theoretical um, comparisons. The proof of this result is based on a generalization of a paper by Van der Bart, Van der Leyen, and Dudor um, to work with exponential TL inequality for second order degenerate U statistics, um, heavily based on work by Chine and colleagues. So I'm going to stop here to see if there are any more questions before we can turn to some simulations to actually see how these methods perform in finite samples. Um, thanks, Eric. So we don't have a lot of time, so can I just ask a Quick clarifying question. So, um, so you're taking this maximum, right? So, what happens if one of your models is really, really bad? So, for example, if like one of your models would be linear regression, would be high, high bias but low variance, would you instead of the maximum, would you want to take uh, quantiles over your models, or would the maximum still work? Or um, so, so I, I, that's a good question. So, according to this result. Um, the mixed minimax bias is only affected by the best learners, but the minimax result will be affected by the um, by both the best learner and the worst learner. However, if you note the structure of this rate, even if the worst learner is order one, the worst learner is order one, um, the, the worst rate of this guy will be mu max times um, w min, omega min. In, in the sense that it's always going to go to zero, but you're going to get some pretty poor rates. So the, the idea here is that, um, of, of, I, I mean, our bottom line is we will prefer, obviously, to prefer the mixed minimax in most of these settings. But uh, we're essentially assuming that whatever learners you're using, you're trying to do the best you can to uh, estimate these nuisance parameters. Um, we're not playing, you know, we're assuming you're not adversarial against your own code. <laughs> of estimating this function as well. Um, but even if you were, uh, you would still be consistent, you would just get really poor rates. So this is not a, this is not a good property of this first selector, but the second select method will not be affected by, by this choice. Now, your, your other, the other part of your question is, should you use something else than the max? I think you, you can, in fact, that's one of the discussion points. Uh, we haven't explored the, the properties. The difficulty is in establishing these Oracle type bounds for any other choice um, turned out to be pretty challenging. Um, but if, if one could, could, could um, be satisfied that the error rate is, is small for other kinds of, 
of, of, of, of distance measure of metrics, um, then, then I would say, sure, you should explore them. All right, great, thanks. That was very helpful. Uh, we only have around 10 minutes left. So minutes. I'm okay, that should be fast. So um, I'm just gonna present, I, um, so it, these are some simulation results. Um, and um, the, the general data engineering mechanism uh, sufficiently complex that simple parametric model assuming linear uh, in the, the regressors were being specified. Um, we used, we're comparing gradient, um, so the comparison here is we double the bias machine learning using gradient boosted trees, lasso, random forest, and then we have our minimax and mixed minimax criteria. And um, the idea was to see how, in terms of the relative bias, the relative bias of our estimators um, perform as sample size increased. And we can see that here um, by trying to choose your selectors with the goal of minimizing the bias by looking at these perturbations, how sensitive is the average causal effect for your choice of murder. Um, you, you, see, you see some gains in terms of bias reduction compared to using the thin vanilla double device machine learning, which uses the nuisance selectors that are best suited for the prediction of either the propensity score or for the outcome regression. And so in, in this sense, it's using the, the incorrect um, risk for selection. And you can sort of see this in, in our simulations. Um, I, I don't have much time to go over this. I just wanted to mention, so we've now uh, talked about how to do a, a machine learner selector. The question is how to do post-selection inference. Um, and the idea is actually connected to something that was asked previously, which is you can always view these selection procedures um, and, and try to find a smooth approximation to the selection process. So what we have developed is a smooth max approximation to the selection process. And it looks like essentially as a model averaging process where I'm not gonna present the, uh, the PKK tilde is chosen, is a super, is chosen to be a smooth approximation of the indicator function that in fact KK tilde is equal to the selector that uh, min, uh, minimizes the, 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 the chosen risk of uh, either the minimax risk or the, the uh, mixed minimax risk. And tau is a tuning parameter um, for, for, it's a scalar tuning parameter for, for this smooth uh, um, approximation. The good choice of the approximation as a smooth function is such that as the tau goes to infinity, this probability uh, gives all its mass at one to this indicator. Okay. And once we have this smooth approximation, it allows for approximately valid inferences accounting for certainty in the selection step in the sense that it's gonna account for the variability in all of the um, candidate um, estimators that you've actually taken a look at and appropriately account for it in, in um, in your inferences. The, the, the bottom line here is that the, the select post-selection inference can be approximately smoothly in such a way that you can view it as an approximate model averaging procedure and account for certainty for it. Um, in the uh, two minutes left, let's consider a, a data application. This is a, one that's been used by several people, right heart characterization in the IC of critical ill patients. And so it's, the outcome is 30 day survival uh, and the, expo the treatment is whether you receive RHC or not. Um, data were available on close to 6,000 individuals, a little over 2,000 were treated, a little over 3,000 were controls, to and we wish to estimate the average causal effect on AD scale. There's 72 covariates we used to adjust for potential confounding. The candidate models that were considered for the propensity score are given here, logistic regression with L1 periodization, classification random trees, gradient boosting trees, and likewise for the outcome regression that you've been given here. So <clears throat> what we did here is we compare our results using the smooth minimax and the smooth mixed minimax estimators with the corresponding confidence intervals to estimators of papers that have used these methods. So uh, Stein, who we're gonna hear from in a couple of minutes, um, has a method called bias reduced. Um, there are two versions of it with the using linear model versus logic models and um, the estimator was basically the same. These are straight out of his JASA paper. The calibrated likelihood estimator of TAN and then TM Melly with default superlearner of Mark van der Land and colleagues. And the bottom line here is that these uh, pretty aggressive selection steps suggest that there is uh, some residual bias in these estimates, as uh, particularly the mixed minimax bias is quite smaller um, relative to the other estimators. 
um, the point estimate, the confidence interval are a little wider, and this is a reflection perhaps of the aggressive model selection steps that we're taking. So you do pay a price potentially in uncertainty uh, once you account appropriately for that model selection step. Some of these methods did not have a model selection step, some of them did. Um, I know Stein has a new approach using a penalized estimate equations version of the bias reduced. We did not compare it to in, in this paper, we compared it to the original approach. Um, so the choice of the criteria, um, so I'm, I'm, this is my last slide. Um, the choice of the criteria could be made more flexible. As mentioned, I think it was Dominic who chimed in and was asking about that. And we may use a different norm rather than the LFDD norm. For example, one could use the empirical mean range of the L2 or L1 norm of the pseudo risk. Um, however, we have not been able to obtain excess, uh, excess bounds, error bounds for, for those other choices. Um, the approach can really be extended to multiply robust influence functions, and we have a paper in progress where we uh, do lots of approach in an invalid IV setting. Another potential extension of our methods in the direction of statistical inference, it would be interesting to actually figure out the exact asymptotic distribution of the proposed estimator with minimax criteria as opposed to using the smooth approximation, which is a, it by itself is a standalone model averaging procedure, but may, may um, not always be um, performed as well as the original minimax criteria. We are also currently exploring a stack generalization by forming convex combination of candidate estimators with weights estimated by minimizing pseudo risk. And, and um, if um, just very quickly, uh, considering these excess bounds, I forgot to mention that you can have a very large number of, of, of selectors here. And so this is very important, this is very useful, particularly in, in um, settings where you might consider uh, model aggregation of, of your learners, in which case the K1 and K2 will correspond to a possible very large exponential number of grid points for values of that convex combination of model learners. So this can also be used in, in that setting. Um, so I'm going to close here. Uh, I want to thank Yifan for helping with the slides and for this work. Um, the paper can be found on the archive, and here are some regular references that show knowledge coming from the NIH. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Uh, model selection for causal interest is certainly a very important topic and uh, not solved by any means. Um, all right, so we're now going to switch to the discussion. We will have Stain uh, give a little presentation. And uh, then afterwards, uh, Eric uh, can respond. And then if we have some, some time left, uh, we, will, we may take some more questions. All right, I'm now switching over to Stain. Sorry, I'm trying to get them uh, full screen. Is this working? Uh, yes. yes, we can. We can yep. see. We can see it. Okay, good. Well, uh, congratulations, Eric, with a uh, very nice work, and uh, congratulations on the talk. You keep on amazing me. Thanks also to the uh, organizers and Guido in particular for inviting me to give this discussion, which I've prepared uh, jointly with uh, Oliver Dukes. So as Eric said, major breakthroughs have been made in, in recent uh, years in terms of targeting the data analysis towards the estimate of interests. And such targeting can be really helpful in removing the bias that variable selection and machine learning procedures may um, imply basically as, as a result of not being well tuned towards the estimates that we're interested in. And that bias removal is really key to obtaining root and consistent estimators along with uh, uniformly valid confidence intervals for the target estimate. Now, given what we've seen in low dimensional settings, I think there's a, a really major remaining potential in additionally targeting the machine learning and variable selection procedures that we tend to use. And so in that sense, I see a lot of value in Eric's proposal, which initially sets out to find the best learner in the sense of minimizing squared bias. Now, because the amount of bias obviously depends on the unknown data generating mechanism, Eric has no choice but to weaken his aim to some extent. In particular, he ends up basically 
recommending that we select the propensity score model at which the double robust estimator would be least sensitive to changes in the outcome model. Maybe I should say least sensitive to sort of the worst change in outcome model that we could make. That makes sense because as Eric pointed out, double robust estimators by nature should have very little sensitivity to, to the choice of outcome model or outcome learner if we're using a correct learner for the propensity score and not otherwise. And so uh, he uses a very similar trick to then select the outcome model. In my opinion, there's still a major remaining potential in going beyond selection. And, uh, and I think that's part of Eric's plan but also in terms of targeting the machine learning procedure itself towards um, minimal bias. And perhaps this notion of looking at perturbations could be used to, to construct a loss function, but it's not readily clear how that would really work. This picture is basically meant to give you a bit of a visual demonstration of what might be happening. So this is showing the bias um, of a double robust estimator for the mean of Y1, the, uh, counterfactual on treatment. In function of a parameter gamma, this is like a one, a scalar parameter in a, in a one dimensional propensity score model. And we have a likewise a parameter in a one dimensional outcome model. Um, if we use standard maximum likelihood to fit these parameters, we would end up with a double robust estimator in this region where you can see a lot of sensitivity to the choice of parameter value um, and I think um, the same could basically end up being the case for each of Eric's candidate learners um, because they're not really, each of the learners themselves is not really trying to prevent uh, sensitivity to perturbations. This is why in our work on uh, high dimensional parametric working models that Eric was pointing to it at some point, we basically choose to work with candidate estimators that are themselves locally insensitive to perturbations, basically by choosing them here on this settle point. To give you a little more detail, in particular, starting from a collection of possibly high dimensional parametric working models. So I'm really simplifying the problem here by looking at parametric models. We basically choose nuisance parameters um, or estimators for the nuisance parameters that force the gradient of the double robust estimator with respect to the nuisance parameters to be zero. And we basically do that after penalizing uh, that gradient by the subgradient of the L1 norm on the nuisance parameters, basically to make sure that we're doing estimation as well as selection. That delivers what we call penalized bias reduced double robust estimators. Um, and I think this approach could in principle be used to select between different candidate parametric models, which uh, in the paper Eric is exploring at least in the simulation studies. Um, at least starting from one big model, um, that kind of approach could in principle be used where I think it, it would have the advantage of not only focusing on selection, but also on estimation, um, both basically aimed at preventing sensitivity to local perturbations. I think the real strength of Eric's work is that it obviously extends um, beyond the parametric setting in, in in particular, it allows us to make a selection between different machine learning algorithms. And so in that sense, um, it has a, a much more generic flavor to it. But I think it would be a, a really great next step if also the, the learning process itself could somehow be targeted. Finally, um, I think it's good to keep in mind that all of these procedures are basically uh, aiming for minimal sensitivity to perturbations, but they're not really directly minimizing bias. And the first question therefore is if Eric could say a bit more on what desirable properties the proposal is really assigning to the final estimator. In our own work, um, we achieve not just double robust estimation, but we also achieve double robust inference basically by dampening the impact of local perturbations. And I think that would not be the case with Eric's proposal, which is making a selection between different candidate estimators each of which may be poorly tuned and be rather sensitive to perturbations. So my first question to Eric is, is whether he could expand a bit on, on the conditions under which he achieves valid inference. It seems that uh, uh, he's probably still reasoning as if um, one of the learners for the propensity score as well as one of the learners 
for the outcome um, is converging to the truth. Uh, I think I, I, I could use a, a little more detail there. Linking to that, um, if we are in a setting where both machine learners are converging to the truth at a sufficiently fast rate, well, then we know from asymptotic theory that the choice of learner is not going to have a lot of impact on the asymptotic behavior of the target estimator. And that brings me to a second, uh, more conceptual question. What is the role of this proposal when a rich collection of machine learnings is being used? May we then realistically assume that at least one of the candidate learners for outcome and treatment each converge to the truth at a possibly sufficiently fast rate, in which case it seems like there might be a little additional benefit, at least asymptotically, of a clever selection strategy. Um, in that sense, I, I think I would have found a comparison with um, like super learner or a standard ensemble learner rather useful. Um, should we expect benefit may more in terms of finite sample behavior? Um, could there be settings where we can benefit by trading slow convergence to the truth or fast convergence to maybe a wrong limit, in which case perhaps the choice of selection strategy may become more influential. But in general, I think that the second question is uh, what can we expect in terms of benefits when um, both learners for propensity score and outcome are both converging to the truth. Thank you. I'll uh, hand over back the word to you. Um, th thank you, Steen, uh, for, as usual, very insightful comments. Um, I, I, I think the, the, I will also uh, maybe answer give me the, uh, to the most um, important question, which is uh, what do we expect um, in terms of inference, if at least one of each of the learners converges at a fast enough rate. And the, the bottom line is, if, I, if, if both of them converge at, at rate n to quarter, one, uh, if, if, you both, if you have a, at least one learner in the outcome regression and one learner in the professor's code that converges at rate faster than n to a quarter, um, the mixed bias um, estimator is guaranteed to have bias being the product of the biases at most, while the um, while the um, minimax um, selector will have the square bias of the worst of the two. Um, and given that we're assuming that both have biases converging to less than two quarter, um, that will still be fine. However, we would expect the the, the risk to be somewhat larger. Um, that's that's the, the goal. In terms of um, inference um, beyond 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 that, um, we haven't. This is one of the the so um, our current result relies on the smooth approximation of the selection uh, procedure, and um, that smooth approximation will will require that most of the mass um, of the selectors will lie on models that will be consistent at a sufficiently fast rate for convergence of psi to at rate root n. And so there, there are a lot of questions that we haven't, we haven't quite explored yet. I think there's a lot of important work that remains in this context. Um, and the general, I think the general challenge is, as, as you said it very eloquently, is um, what kind of procedure might I have to select uh, nuisance parameters in the, and when I'm targeting a functional, um, where there is no unbiased estimator of the risk of that functional. Um, the our strategy is to change the problem into one of um, model robustness, which is the choice of, of the selector. Uh, and in, 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 in what we, we believe are weaker conditions than the standard conditions, we do recover um, estimators that behave appropriately well in our samples. Um, I think that's probably all I have time for. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions from the audience or comments. Um, yes, yeah, so we have time for one quick question. So uh, let me unmute um, Ilya. Uh, All right, Ilya, you should be unmuted. Great. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, let's see. So, uh, Eric, so thanks for, for an amazing talk, uh, as, as always. 
And uh, my, I guess my question is, so you're, you're very transparent about changing the, the loss because you don't get the true loss uh, and that minimizing this loss doesn't necessarily lead to anything good. And so my question is, is there anything we can say about classes of full data distributions or nuisance functions or something where, where that will work basically, where that will coincide with minimizing the true loss or is that too hard to talk about? Um, I, so that, that is a good question. No, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, so, so I, I think, um, no, I don't have, I don't have an answer to that question. What, what sub model would this minimization strategy of the risk correspond to actually minimizing directly minimizing the bias square of the functional? Yeah. Um, I, I don't have an answer to that. It's a good question though. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ilya. Um, I All think right. we are out of time. Yeah. All right. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eric and Steen, for a fantastic talk and a great discussion. And also for like just taking the time to participate, uh, participate here. Um, next Tuesday, we have Ilya from Johns Hopkins uh, talk about identification and estimation in graphical models of missing data. Um, this is joint work with uh, a couple of people, uh, Rohit, Razi, Daniel, Eric, again, and James. Uh, the discussion will be Chin Tiang from Iowa State University, so we're very much looking forward to the talk next week. Um, thank you all for joining today. Thank you, uh, speaker and the discussant again. And I hope you all stay safe and uh, we see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.